Uh, and there are all kinds of kind of ways you can explore that. I mean, uh, I did a little experiment of um, putting, going to Google Images UK, and I put professor into Google Images, and I think the first hundred uh, produced 97 men and three female professors. And I thought, this is quite interesting, because even I, I'm a female professor. And if I think professor, I still think male. So what do you do about it? I, mean, I, I came to the conclusion that, in a sense, it is never likely to be possible to somehow force women into a template of power which is male. That actually there is, there is a certain impossibility. Why, why these women wear trouser suits and speak low is because power is defined as male. And what we need to do therefore, and this is easy to say but far less easy actually to do, is we have to say that we shouldn't be thinking about changing the women into fitting them into a male version of power, we should be thinking about changing the male version of power so that women can play their part in it. Now, that must be true. I mean, I have no doubt that that is true. The, the question is, you know, how do you do it? Is there any, you know, is there any possible indication that it might be feasible as a procedure? I think there, is a, there are some bits of optimism. I mean, I, I, you know, partly because I'm an academic, I think always that just thinking those things through always turn out to be important. Right? If you actually start to say, so what does power look like to us? Could we think about it being operating differently? I think you start to be more aware of it. And I think power is... is it's terribly, terribly kind of objectified in contemporary culture, and I suspect it always has been. Now, power is a thing that I have, and the more I have of it, the less you can have of it. You know, it's a kind of zero-sum game, and what I take leaves less available for the rest of you. It's, it's also something which goes along with recognition, Celebrity. I mean, it's very hard, actually, normally, to think of a powerful person whose name we wouldn't know. Power is partly about fame. It also implies a division of culture into people who have power and those who don't, into the leaders and the followers. And that goes, I think, for every kind of operation you like. My university is always running courses which says uh, come to a you know a staff development management course on how to be a leader. Right? And I occasionally have uh, and I think they got fed up with this now want to say I want a course on how to be a follower. <laughs> you know, we're not, you know, we have a version of power. We can't all be leaders. So how is this going to work out? Now, my, my aim, and it will take much longer than I have left of my life, though I'll give you one good example of optimism. You know, I think it's much better to think about power, not as a uh, something we can have. I've got more of it than you. But it, it's, it's not so much a noun, it's not a thing, it's more a verb. It's more about, can I get things done? Will people listen to me? Have I, can I be taken seriously? Can I learn to take other people seriously? Can you think of power, not in terms of followers and leaders, but interaction? which leads to some kind of result without leading to you know, uh, fame, celebrity, recognition. Now, you might think, well, that sounds fine, but it's pie in the sky. But I'll give you just one example of where I was very struck that something like that had worked. That uh, one of the, 
Uh, I think most influential movements in the United States over the last, what, five years has been the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, it's been important, it's been controversial in some ways, but nobody could ever claim that Black Lives Matter had not altered the way that people were thinking about race in America. Now, you may be much better informed than I was, but I rather doubt that any of you know who the founders of Black Lives Matter were, <coughs> and they were three women, and none of their names are household names. Now, even in the States, I mean, occasionally they go and give talks, but it's, they're not, they don't have recognition. Now, actually, they have started a movement which has been taken seriously, which is effective and does alter the way people think about things. And they did it without becoming celebrity figureheads. They did it by being operational. And I kind of think I'd like that to be some kind of model for the future. I don't you know. As I say, it'll be longer than I've got to see it. But we don't have to have, I think we don't have to have the model of power that we have. And we don't have to change women. In fact, I think it's easier to change the model of power than it is to change women to fit in with blokes' idea of power. <laughs> I think. Yo no le diré que a usted es un model de poder porque no le agradará, pero sí que es un model de conexión. Yo creo que eso exige también un compromiso. Me parece que cuando la van a buscar de la BBC para proponerle que que haces divulgación, que haces programas, usted tan trata no volía hacerlo y la persona que la va a venir buscar le va a decir, escucha, siempre te estás cachando, que no me sufan los hombres de eso, por tan, por ser arriba de un momento, por ser eres tú la que has de hacerlo y todo eso que usted va a aceptar o va a hacer, por eso la tenemos aquí, por eso la hemos descubierto, pero es evident que eso también tiene un preu para usted, porque usted es muy conocida también como una persona experta en puntas de trons. Abans la veía por teléfono y no sabía si estaba respondiendo a un ataque, y esta exposición pública también es, es difícil. Uh, it is, and in, in some ways I think I was right to be anxious. Um, I mean, I thought two things about television. I thought that doing it was always going to be very, very low level. Uh, I thought it was always going to involve, um, if you did Romans, um, people pretending to be Romans, you know, bad actors dressing up in sheets, <laughs> pretending to be Romans, right? So one thing I did say, I said, no dressing up. In any program I do, no dressing up. Um, but that's right, I mean, I, it, things, things happen to you in very unexpected ways. And the, uh, a senior executive at BBC, who actually was a historian herself originally, had read my Pompeii book on holiday and just thought, oh, that would make a good TV program. Um, happily, it didn't happen until I was well over 50. Thank God, because I think, you know, when you're well over 50, nothing much matters to you in the same way that it does when you're under 50. Right? Um, but first of all, I said no. Right. And she said, look, you're always complaining. Um, you're particularly complaining about all those wrinkly old men doing history documentaries. And then you have the nerve to tell me you won't do it. <laughs> I give in. And it, you know, in some ways it has changed my life. And it's changed my life in kind of, again, in very, very unexpected ways. And uh, partly, um, and this is, I think, really surprising, it was the backlash by a well-known British critic against one of my television programmes that really put me in the public eye. There's a guy who recently died called A.A. Gill, Adrian Gill, and he reviewed one of my, a very, very strident television reviewer. And he said something like, God, she has the nerve to put herself on the television when she looks like that. You know, you know, couldn't she do something about her appearance? Couldn't she get her teeth fixed? Couldn't she do her hair? I mean, if you are going to come into people's living rooms, you might at least dress properly. 